This is Back of the Net and Beyond. My name is Danny Thomas, and today I'm going to be speaking to former professional footballer and ex-teammate Narada Bernard. How's it going, bro? You okay? Yes, Dan. I'm good, man. Good to see you, bro. Yeah, man. I, I miss that smile, man, and all them teeth. <laughs> 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 yeah, I've got a few. I've got a few. <laughs> no, man. Long time no see. Thanks for coming on, by the way. Mm, yeah, no worries, man. Pleasure to be here, man. How's life? Talk to me. Uh, life's good, man. I can't complain. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a different Narada to the Narada you would have met uh, back in what 2001, 2002, I think it might have been. Um, obviously, my dad now. That's the that's the biggest change. Uh, engaged and nice. Yeah, yeah. Just just trying to you know take care of life. Mm, congrats, bro. Um, sounds good. Obviously, everyone's grown up and that. Like you said, we, we go back kind of way, way back indirectly mm -hmm. through football, which we'll touch on later on. But first met kind of 2001-ish, around that time, 2002. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, like I said, we'll, we'll speak about that a bit later on. And just let everyone know, like, what you're doing now, nowadays, kind of on a daily basis. Yeah, so now um, I work in property. I'm an estate agent. Um, have been for nearly six years. Mm. Um, which is going all good and you know it's a great great industry I live in London so um, that's, you know, that's where I'm from mm. but um, so as far as London's concerned I'm in North London and it's yeah it's, it's a great place to be um, I work directly in lettings so lettings only um, mm. don't do sales um, and lettings in London it's just it's been crazy it's been crazy but, um, ah, it, I can imagine way. yeah mm. that's mad because obviously uh, we spoke kind of briefly up there, just touching base on that. And literally, I, I thought that you were a PT instructor, basically, because I see you obviously doing stuff online and that, and that's all I see. So I thought, ah, oh, nice. And obviously, for you to say that you're now working in lettings in an estate agent, that's basically what I'm doing and have been for, well, just a bit longer than you, nearly seven and a half years. Mm. Uh, that's mad. How, how are you finding that? Obviously, because it's completely different from football and in terms of yeah. where I am, I'm based in Coventry, although I'm not from Coventry, I'm from Leamington, as you know. Um, mm. But lettings and, and the property world up here is completely different to, to London. So I speak to a lot of investors and people like property developers who are from London. And you can just get, when I speak to them, I understand kind of why they're not getting confused, but they see things differently to how we see things up here. So like, mm. how is it? How does it work for you guys down there? I'm assuming it's just manic 24-7. It is. I mean, I guess London is such a it's such a, a bubble of a place when it comes to, you know, the economy really. But in like I so I, I work in Camden, right? And and Camden's such a diverse area. I mean, and I mean diverse in culture, diverse in properties. So we kind of have something for everyone. So, you know, there's the council estates, there's the million pound houses, there's a the new builds, um, you know, there's a period, tree line streets, you know, Primrose Hill, etc. So it's for us, we, we, I'm quite lucky and since I work in a patch where we're generally busy throughout the year, we have peaks, obviously, our summer season is our peaks, like now it's just manic. Today was just a crazy day. But, um, you know, the market itself is just, as I said, we, we, London's a bubble. Um, there's times when you can't believe, you know, people are paying X amount, you know, of their wages on their rent and just to live in London. And I guess to, to, to benefit from the London wage, which tends to be quite good, you know, depending on the industry you're in and the job you do. But the opportunity is the main thing in London. It's crazy. So for that reason, the the letting market is always, is always bubbling, always. Crazy, mate. I mean, I was talking to my wife uh, last week. Um, we had some quiet time in the office, so me and my colleague were just talking about like properties in London. So he's mm. in sales, so he was looking at like houses to buy, just random houses. And we were looking at crazy places like Mayfair and stuff, and like mm. 50, 60 million plus houses. And I was looking <laughs> at the letting side of things. And some of the houses, the apartments even, to rent down there, it's like, you're looking at, like we were looking at crazy ones, five grand a, a, a week. and just madness and then we were just thinking how are people actually <laughs> is it really happening it's just it crazy it is it's actually crazy some of the lets i see 
Um, North London is a great area, a vibrant area, you know, from Islington, Camden, Hampstead. You've got all these areas and, um, you know, they're diverse, you know, and I mean that in culture-wise and property-wise. So you get you get all walks of life. And, I mean, you can have a millionaire living next, next door to, you know, a social housing tenant, for instance, um, and that's very common. Yeah. You know, you have, you have them within the same building. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah. And it's just the way, I mean, I, I personally believe that's why London is what it is. It's such a great place because everyone lives amongst each other. We get on with each other. Um, and I think it makes it the place it is. Mm. Uh, but, yeah, in London, the rent is just, you know, depending on where you are. It's not, it's not that, to be honest with you, if you're on the outskirts, it's not so bad. But... Mm. Um, I meet people every day and you meet people from, you know, up north, people from different countries, yeah. um, in particular people from different countries, they can't believe that, like, the money they spend on a studio in yeah. their home country, they're normally getting like a, a crazy place central to their, you know, yeah. in their town centre kind of thing. Yeah. And I always have to explain to them, look, this is London, like, if you want creme de la creme, it's going to cost you dough, dough, you know what I mean? It's going to cost you money. It's going to cost you your whole salary. <laughs> yeah, literally, literally. Wow. That's yeah. madness, man. I'm, I'm glad you're doing that, though. I'm glad you're in the industry because it's a good industry <laughs> to be in and you meet so many different people. I mean, again, mm. in football, it's it's one of them situations where you go from club to club and you, you come across different players and different managers and different personalities and people mm. from different walks of life. And it's pretty much the same in, in the estate agency world as well um, because you meet people from different walks of life, uh, different colours, creeds and different kind of, um, in terms of expenditure and different salaries and things like that. So for me, I enjoyed it in terms of my transition because I was allowed to kind of be in the office environment, but always, I was always out in, in general yeah. as well. So I wasn't just confined to the office. Um, yeah. So from, from that perspective, I was able to build on my uh, communication skills and um, just general development really. So I'm assuming it's pretty much the same for yourself. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it was exactly the same. I mean, so when I kind of finished football, I finished football and my first, so I stopped playing football properly when I was 30. All right. So I was at St. Albans. Um, I had my daughter. She she was born. And I got to a stage where I decided, I mean, look, I was, I was playing part time at St. Albans. Um, and then I was also working on the side, but I was, uh, what was I doing? I think I might have been doing... I might be doing some delivery driving. I don't know. Something that I didn't enjoy doing, basically. <laughs> and I was just doing it to make up the money that, you know, that I needed to earn. And and then it got to a stage where I became a dad. And I was like, you know what? I'm working. I'm playing football. I'm a dad now. Mm. And something had to give. Because the time, you know, I'm working in the day. Then, as you know, when you're semi-pro, you're, you're training Tuesday night, Thursday night. Then you play Saturday and I was just, it just wasn't adding up. I was like, I can't, I can't do this. Um, and then I decided to then quit football. Like literally I, I quit it. I mm. said no more, I'm not going to play no more. And I decided to find a career and I went into personal training. Um, Cause it was natural. It was just a natural transition for me. You know, still in the sports industry. I dabbled in a bit of um, coaching as well. Okay. But there was something about personal training that really, it, it took to me. It was, I think it was the way in which you had to um, be good at communicating with people. Mm. Um, I don't know. I mean, at that time, I didn't really know much about sales, but um, I, I knew that after I did my PT course and I understood what it meant, um, yeah. you know, the, the sports side, as well as going out and having to communicate with people, I thought, actually, I can do this. And I worked in London Bridge in London, um, and the money was, you know, it was really good. You yeah. meet it all sorts of people, bankers in particular, where I was working at the time. Um, and I had, I actually felt a purpose. I had something to give, you know. You know, it's, it's well as doing my qualification, which was great. But I was actually meeting people and they was actually saying to me, oh, you know, I, I seen your, you know, whether it be my physique or the way I train other people. Yeah. Um, and then within the gym, you have a profile and your profile was ex-footballer. And then people would approach me saying, oh, hey, I play football. Yeah. And I felt like there was a good purpose for me. And um, mm. I think I did quite well in it. But mm. um, I stopped doing it because there was a lot of inconsistency in it. Maybe that was a flaw in my own business, by the way. So <laughs> there are a lot of personal trainers who you know, made loads of money. Yeah. But for me, there was too much inconsistency of it. 
So, and that's when I decided, uh, I actually switched from personal training to gym membership sales for a bit, because the, 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 within my gym I was working, they kept saying to me, oh, you should, you know, come and work, you know, they saw where I was around the gym, getting yeah. to know people. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I made that transition, I thought, you know what, let's do it, so I tried it, um, did well, and then that was all good, but I thought, how long am I going to be selling gym memberships for? You know what I mean? I was getting older, and then I decided for, I wanted to find an industry that I felt I can grow in and get old in and still mm -hmm. do it, okay? Mm -hmm. That's how I got here. That's massive, man, and it seems like, obviously, I know you personally anyway, so I know you've got your head screwed on, and like you said, kind of, everyone grows up. We first met 2001, and we were still not kids, because obviously we're still we were professionals within the game, and we still knew what we wanted to do, and we tried to achieve what we wanted to achieve in the game. But as you grow older, and obviously when you have kids, it's no longer about yourself. It's always family first. So yeah. then you need to find something that's kind of sustainable. And that was kind of my train of thought as well. I knew that property is always going to be around, even if there's a, a crash, which we've had kind of, say, recently, indirectly, and back in, like, credit crunch times as well. Property is always going to be there. People always need to have a home to live in. People are always going to move through different circumstances. So it's always going to be there. So mm. I found that, like you did, and I haven't really looked back since and got my accreditations, got my ILA accreditation. Don't know if you've got, have you got that? If you haven't, you need to get it. I've got my ILA, come on. Uh, recently, <laughs> Only recently, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's one of them. For me, I always, I, the company that I went to initially, no longer working for them anymore, but forever yeah. grateful because they gave me an opportunity because literally, as you know, our CVs are just sports-based. When you have mm -hmm. your interview, it's, there's no point going into that interview and talking about who you played for and how many appearances you make because it doesn't mm -hmm. bring in anything. It's no value to the company. So yeah. you have to sell yourself through your personality and obviously through your transferable skills, which we'll touch on a bit later on. Um, yeah. And that's kind of the main focus for the podcast, really. Um, but yeah, I mean, really, I'm happy to, to hear that you're doing well. Um, obviously, you used to play football, and I mentioned that yeah. at the top of the podcast. Um, and you started off, I think you started at, was it Tottenham? And then you, you started part of your YT there and then you went on to Arsenal. Is that right? Yeah, so I started at Tottenham at the age of 11. That's when I went to Tottenham. Uh, school of, uh, school boys. School boys? No, School of Excellence it was. Yeah. Um, got scouted from my Sunday league team. Um, so I was there from 11, training, which at that time, uh, Ron Henry, who's a, an ex-Tottenham left back, um, he was the, the coach. And then from then, you then get the opportunity to meet up because there was lots of different School of Excellence plotting around London. Mm. And then you get the opportunity to then, if you do well, to then meet up with all of these different School of Excellence. Um, and there was one massive game, mm. uh, or there was a few big games, I think. And then at the end of that, whoever made it then got Schoolboys, which was at 14. Um, and then, yeah, that was that. And then, and then you obviously, you're fighting for a position for YTS. And then I got that. So I was at Tottenham for, for um, I left Tottenham when I was 18, so, okay. yeah, wow. that was sad though, I'm not going to lie, I'm a Tottenham fan, I was, I cried my eyes out then, really? I'm not going to lie, yeah, cried my eyes. Because I expected then, because I know sometimes, like for me, I never really experienced that, because I always, I was always told a bit earlier that I was going to be off with something, and then I'd always hear kind of the other players coming out of the office or whatever, just saying that I haven't been offered anything, and it was mm. always quite sad. Uh, but some of them were unexpected and some of them expected it, but they just didn't want to hear it, obviously. So what yeah. was your experience? Did you, were you aware of it or were you kind of assuming that you'd get a contract or what? Yeah, no, I've been on both sides of the scales, whether I expected it and didn't expect it. In this, in this particular situation, I definitely didn't expect it. I think that's why it hit me hard. Yeah. And I really didn't expect it. Um, you know, within Tottenham, I did okay. I played, you know, at the young age, I played reserve football. Mm. Um, I got my YTS pretty, you know, pretty uh, quite good. I didn't, you know, I didn't have any concerns whether I'd get it yeah. or not. Um, and I was just one of those players, you know, I got selected. There was a, did you play in the Milk Cup? I, I did, yeah. I, I did. Yeah. I played there when I was at Forest and, yeah, I didn't enjoy it, to be fair. <laughs> Yeah. So we went to the Milk Cup and I got selected to go in the Milk Cup before I was even YTS. So it was only a couple. It was me, um, Ledley King, another kid called Nicky Hunt, uh, Peter Crouch. Wow. 
Yeah. Uh, Glenn Paul, I think, came one year as well. So there was a few of us who were the younger team, the younger lot, who wasn't yeah. quite YPS, but we got selected. So I was always in and around it, you know, playing. So when I didn't get the, the pro at Tottenham, and my manager was, my manager at the time, Bob Arbor, he was like, he was sent, showing me signs that he thought I would get it. Mm. Um, but the, the person who made the decision, which is Colin Murphy, he sat me in the room and he's like, look, everyone, his words were, this is word for, almost word for word. He basically said that everyone thinks that you should get pro, but I don't think you should because I don't think you're going to make it into the first team at Tottenham. So for that reason, you're not going to get it. Right. And so it, it hit me hard. Like I, I remember walking out of that office, floods of tears. Yeah. Um, which was, yeah, it was hard to accept. You're only young, you're 18. Yeah. You know, I left school with... You know, I, I left school, I didn't do fantastic in school, but I left school with, a, in my head, a career. I thought, you know what, just don't even need to go to college. Got yeah. my wife, yes. And I guess I, you know, maybe took it for granted a bit, but expected to get pro at Tottenham. Um, yeah. Didn't happen. I'm sure uh, Colin Murphy used to, I'm sure he was at Leicester for a little bit when I was there, when I was younger. Sure he may have been. been. He yeah. may have been. Um, and then obviously, so you left Tottenham and then you, you ended up at Arsenal. So how was that experience? That was that was surreal. So my story with uh, Arsenal was surreal. I think even like, even I pinched myself that that happened. Um, but so we was, this is, this is how the story went. I'd been told I'm not getting pro at Tottenham. Yeah. So I was, then our final game of the season was against Arsenal. So we played against Arsenal, um, and this was like an under-19s game, I think it was. And lo and behold, I was playing against Jermaine Penham. Okay. Now, at the time, I did have did not have a clue who he was. So I played... So you got to imagine, my mindset is I'm not getting pro. I'm playing against Arsenal. I have no... In my head, I'm not thinking I'm trying to play well to, to play for Arsenal. I'm just playing with no fear. Um, anyway, end of the game comes now. My manager, Bob Arbor, who I mentioned earlier, he says to me, where's your dad? Where's your dad? And I'm like, I'm in the shower. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. He goes, get your dad. Get your dad. Get out of the shower and get your dad. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, what's going on? He goes, just get your dad. Get your dad. So I get out of the shower, get my dad. He goes, right, walk, walk, walk around that corner. Someone wants to talk to you. And I'm like, wow, my dad's like, what's going on? I said, dad. <laughs> so we walk around the corner. Yeah. And it's, it's Arsene Wenger and, and Liam Brady. Shut up. So I, on my mother's life, so I walk around the corner, I'm like, what the f what's going on here? <laughs> but then Brady's like, Wenger's, you know, he's, he's quite quiet. He said one or two words. And Brady was like, you know, he basically said to me, do you know who you're playing against today? And I was like, no. He goes, that was your main pennant. You know, he's our first million pound player. And I went, yeah. a 16 year old million pound player. And I was like, okay, I, I didn't even know. I didn't even know it was him. I knew of him. Yeah, yeah. And then we went, well, no one's ever marked him out the game like that before. Um, and off the basis of that, I've spoken to Tottenham and they said they're not keeping you. So yeah. we'd like to offer you a trial. Right. And I was like, cool. My dad's pinching me saying, yeah, you know what I mean? So, yeah. <laughs> so um, they took me to south of France. I think it was for a week or 10 days. I can't remember what it was. Yeah. So I went over to south of France. We played in a tournament. We played like maybe three or four games within, within like three days. Um, I played in all the games. Then I came home. So my dad, like, I was obviously very aware of Ashley Cole, who's my age, my position, yeah. killing the scene, doing well. So I was very aware of him. And so my dad was like, how did you do? How did you do? I said, Dad, look, I did all right, but they've got Ashley Cole. Like, mm. it's long. And my dad was like, yeah, but you don't know. You know, you never know. And I'm like, Dad, trust me. Like, they've got Ashley Cole. We're good. <laughs> And he's like, well, you never know. Anyway, so the phone rings, Liam Brady. And yeah, they offered me, they said, we want to offer you a year pro contract. And that's exactly how it happened. And when the phone went down, I was like, what? Yeah. Okay. Arsenal. It was so weird. So weird. That's nuts. And that's, uh, that's how things can happen in life, but more so in football, because that's, that's how football is. Um, mm -hmm. And that is a crazy story. I, I didn't know that. Um, I just thought you left there and then kind of, Tottenham just said, yeah, we want to take it. I didn't know about the whole story thing, so that's mm. crazy. Um, at the time, so you went to France and that, and you, you mentioned you played in the team. So where was Ashley then? Was he part of the squad or injured? Or... No, no. So Ashley, he wasn't in that tournament. He wasn't uh, amongst that lot. But when I came back, 
uh, when we started that season, Ashley, he was there for a little bit, but I don't know if you remember the season when he went on loan to Crystal Palace. Yeah, yeah. So that was the season I was at Tottenham, uh, Arsenal. So, so, look, I'll be honest. I actually think they signed me because they liked what they saw, but they also knew Ashley was going on loan. So they probably thought, you know what, we need someone here. Mm. Uh, he looks like he knows what he's doing, whatever. Yeah. And uh, basically, Brady's exact words was to me, which, look, Ashley is the person we're, you know, trying to push. Mm-hmm. However, you've got an opportunity here. You've got a year. Show us what you can do. That was, you know, th- those are almost the words. Um, so I went there with the know-how that, you know, I'm kind of in Ashley's shadow. Not not to mention Winterburn was in the first team. Silvino was there. Then there was Ashley. Then there was me. So, you know, it was kind of like I didn't have nothing to lose, to be honest. Yeah. Um and I think I went there, I probably, I would say that was probably the best football I played in my career in that season. And not to mention, I learned the most there. Yeah. Um, I'll give you a, a quick story. My first game for Arsenal was against Tottenham. Oh. <laughs> and it was mad. It was a, it was another, it was a, what was it? I think it was under 19's game still. And we played this game and half time comes. And uh, Liam Brady's watching the game, and he put like the, he wasn't the manager, by the way. He was just he always watched the games, overlooked yeah, the game, yeah. and he pulled me away from the manager, who was uh, Don Howe and um, uh, Don Givens, yeah. and he pulled me away and he said, "Listen, you're not at Tottenham no more. Stop kicking the ball long." And I was like, "Wow, rude awakening." He's like, "At Arsenal, we play football," yeah. and that was my introduction to. Because I'm used to playing with like Crouchy up front, yeah, and yeah. it was like long ball, get it off Crouchy, you know, knock it off him, and then whatever. Yeah, and I had to adapt so quickly, and um, it was for me. I learned so much in that year, whether I was ever going to make it or not at Arsenal. I learned so much from that club. Um, it just in the style of their training, their ethos, and how they kind of structured their training sessions and what they wanted to do. And to be honest, I went there, I even felt way behind a lot of them. Okay. Truthfully, I did, because they were used to, like, they did, on a Thursday, we would do weak foot training. Weak foot. So, <laughs> Thursday, you do a double on a Thursday, and in yeah. the evening, well, not evening, but like, I don't know, two o'clock, you go out, and the whole session is just your weak foot. I've never done that in my life at Tottenham. I would have been struggling, because you know what my life is like. I would have been doing <laughs> <laughs> It's like mine, the standing foot. Yeah. Uh, wow. but yeah, That's yeah, nice. I remember because obviously I was at Leicester when talking about that time now, that period there. I was at Leicester, so I was playing reserves, and I remember playing a couple of games against kind of Arsenal, um, home and away, obviously. And yeah, Arsenal were always just ridiculously in terms of like ridiculously talented in terms of tactics mm-hmm. and just game understanding and like passages of play. And the, the players you guys had, aside from kind of youth team and reserves, like the whole, in terms of like the first team squad, ridiculous. So it must have been difficult knowing that, like you said, you've got Ashley in front of you, then Silvino, and then Winterburn, and then, yeah, just, it must have been hard work, but obviously a great opportunity. Um, but I mean, who were you playing with? Just let, let everyone know, because obviously I know, but just let other people know who was in your kind of uh, peer group. So my age group at Arsenal was like Lee Canneville. I know he was on here, wasn't he? You had Canners, you had Reese Weston, you had Ashley Cole. Um, obviously, the likes of like your um, Jermaine Pennant, uh, even like um, what's his face, uh, like Rowan Wickers used to come up. David Bentley would come up. Stephen Sidwell, Joe Kafur, um, what's his face, Jay Boffroyd. Uh, Paolo Vanat, so all these players, like I can reel them off, and yeah. all st- I'm still friends with them, all of them now, yeah. and they was all superb. Like I-, I remember seeing these kids and thinking, and some of them, well, a lot of them are younger than me. I was thinking, yo, these kids have got more talent than I've got in my, you know, whole body, and they've got it in their little finger. Like there were some talented kids. Um, and it was, yeah, like, I, I personally, as I said, that's why I learned so much at Arsenal. And I, I hold my hands up. I went there and I felt like I was, I wouldn't say below them, but I felt like I was, I think I was one of those players that 
if I was around good players, like Paolo, yeah, he used to say to me in Narada, if you play, if you have to go to a club and you don't have to train, you and we just play games, you said they'll sign you and they'll love you. But in training, I was all, you train with me. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I wasn't serious enough, you know what I mean? I was quite, you know, I, I enjoyed my training, but, you know, but in games, that's where I really got focused. But, um, yeah, I just think in that club, there was just so, so much talent. So, like... Talent, I'm talking talent upon talent. I mean, look, you saw what the youth team did at Arsenal. They just yeah. won things and, yeah, <laughs> superb, superb. Um, yeah, so I always remember Arsenal having loads of players. That was one thing that kind of, you know, <laughs> of I don't know how, like, A and the B team and all those, and just me yeah. and the players, it was just ridiculous. But, um, I mean, like I said, good times. I enjoyed it um, in terms of playing against teams like Arsenal, um, especially knowing that kind of I left Lily Shaw and then had players at Arsenal like, uh, Lee Canavan and, and Reese Weston, who I was familiar with. So it was always one of their men. David Noble as well. I've not even mentioned him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, obviously, so when you play against someone who you've kind of played with previously, you always want to put on a decent show. And I remember playing against Arsenal, and that's when I kind of kicked on when I was at Leicester, because I remember doing well there in the reserves and stuff. And then I think mm. that season I made my debut for Leicester. So um, that was a massive season for me. But then you, so obviously you left Arsenal and then you went to Bournemouth, I believe. <laughs> And then obviously that's where kind of we met our, our players and, and yeah. teammates. So talk to me about Bournemouth. Like, how was that for you going from Arsenal and then going to obviously Bournemouth with not no disrespect, but lesser players to a certain degree? Yeah. Um, their mentality or, or outlook on the game is going to be slightly different because they're looking to leave that division and, and yeah. step up a level or two. Um, mm. Real men's football, people have got mortgages and rent to pay. It's not reserved team football. But different facilities, so obviously the facilities and, and, and things like that are not going to be there, not going to be the same as Arsenal. So how was that all kind of, that process for you? It was, um, so it was exciting at the time. I remember when I left Arsenal, um, I actually had, funny enough, I had Leicester trying to get me. Maybe they were trying to replace you, Dan. Nah, I, was, I, was left wing. <laughs> I was left wing, so it wasn't that. <laughs> I'm only joking. I'm only joking. <laughs> but when I when I left Arsenal, I had quite a few clubs. Um, I did I did decent at Arsenal, um, and I had a few clubs who I could have signed for. Um, but I remember Arsenal saying to me, "Go to Bournemouth." Um, they didn't offer me Bournemouth didn't offer me the highest wage. I had other clubs offering me a higher wage, and I remember even my agent at the time. He was so annoyed at me. He's pissed. He's like, "Well," because I basically chose Bournemouth because what Arsenal said. But he had a different deal for me. Um, and he and it was at Colchester, I think it was. And he's like, I'm getting you this amount, and you why have you signed for that amount? But my gut feeling was I had Liam Brady, I had people who'd said like Rio Ferdinand had been to Bournemouth on loan, John O'Shea had been to Bournemouth on loan, yeah. and these players had always progressed. Um, and Arsenal said that you know I think you should go there because they're gonna um, suit you know your style. They play football and stuff. Yeah. So when I went there, I went there confident, etc. Um, Mel Matcham signed me, um, and I was like, "Yeah, I was thinking, do you know what? I'm going. Okay, I'm going down, but I also thought I'm going into a first team. Yeah. And I was always a believer of, you know, although I wanted to stay high as much as high in, in, in the ranks as I could, I wanted to play. That was me. I just wanted to play." Um, and boom, said they're going to offer me the opportunity. So went there, um, and then to be honest, it went crazy from that point because the second like, I signed, yeah. came back, I was really happy. You know, got my squad number and all this thing. You know, I didn't have that at Arsenal. I didn't have that at Tottenham. Mm -hmm. So I had my first team squad number now, and it was all good. My name on my shirt, all these things. And then within two weeks, the manager blimmin resigned, and I was like, "What?" So we hadn't been two weeks into preseason, and the, and the gaffer, the old mate, said, "I'm not going to do it no more." I was like, "Okay, when does that leave me?" So the manager, Sean O'Driscoll, at the time, um, you know, he was the manager, and to be honest, I, I had a terrible preseason. I got knocked out in preseason. Don't know if you remember. So um, I didn't. Was I wasn't there at that point. Oh, you came my second season? Yeah. Yeah. So my first season, um, I played, we were playing at Basingstoke. Basically, the pitch was tiny and very close to the pitch was like the kind of railings. Mm -hmm. Someone barged me, hit my head, 
blacked out, woke up in hospital. So I wasn't allowed to play for two weeks. Um, so that was pre-season done for me. Um, and then I didn't start the season. I remember feeling so annoyed. I thought I would start the season. Didn't. And then I just had a lot of injuries there. Me and Sean, I wouldn't say we had a bad relationship, but we didn't see eye to eye. Yeah. Something about him he didn't like. I don't think he liked me too tough and, you know, whatever. Um, and I just didn't have a great, you know, I don't know, I made, I don't know, 50 odd appearances, whatever. And it just, it never sat well with me there, you know. Yeah. Although I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed my time there because I had, you know, first team experience. Of course. I, I mean, I resonate with a few things you said there because it's happened to me before. And you mentioned, obviously, you signed and then the gaffer left. And literally, I, I remember I signed for Macclesfield. This is kind of mid-stage of my career. So I'm like probably, what, 20, 25, call it. And I signed for Macclesfield. Paul Ince is the manager. So I'm thinking, Paul Ince wants to sign me. And the boardroom, they bought the boardroom, because the season before, I was like in between clubs, and I, I didn't really play. And at the back end of the season, I, I secured a contract at Hereford. And I played well. I played like the last 10, 15 games. And then, mm. obviously, we played against Macclesfield and whatever. So... Um, they wanted to sign me off the back of just playing 15 games the previous season. So, agent at the time calls me and I'm on holiday and he's like, Macclesfield, and I'm like, I'm in an R because I'm thinking, I've been away from home since I was 14, travelling and whatever, and I just wanted to be closer to home. But then I yeah. thought, it's probably the first, maybe one of, one of the first clubs that kind of really, aside from Bournemouth, there's a couple, not many, that really wanted to sign me. Because you know, it's mm. like, come like season ending, off season, everyone's scrambling around for clubs. Um, so I was always used to doing that. So for my agent to call me saying, look, Paul Lintz wants you and the club want to give you a year, but Paul Lintz is trying to get them to give you two years. I was like, wow, he really wants me. Anyway, yeah. I ended up signing, but then the next day he left and went to MK Doms. And I was <laughs> like, what's going on? So in one hand, I'm happy that I've secured a contract pretty early in the off season. Yeah. Next minute, like he's gone to MK Dons, and I'm thinking, if I just delayed it, because it was supposed to be me, Francis Green, and I think the guy was called Mark Wright, right winger, um, mm. and Paul Ince was building the team. So me and Green, he signed because we had the same agent. And then Mark Wright, I think he got wind that my, um, Paul Ince was going to be leaving. So he mm. delayed it slightly, and then next minute, a week later, he signed for MK Dons, and then the rest is history. So I was just like, Wow. A typical scenario where it could never just be 100% perfect, but that's football yeah. for you. Um, but yeah, I mean, I remember when I when I joined Bournemouth and you guys were there, and I, I kind of knew you indirectly anyway, just from obviously football and the football community. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I knew of you, but I didn't really know you. And obviously, we were there for, what was it, probably six months together, if that, maybe slightly longer, because obviously, I think it was your second year. And then mm. after that, you obviously left. So we had a short spell together. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I understand what you mean in terms of kind of your relationship with Sean, because I've had that with different managers before as well. Um, and sometimes it's nothing to do with your ability. It's just one of them where no matter what you do, the manager's probably going to pick someone ahead of you. Um, yeah. It's frustrating. And again, this is another side of football that people don't see. And you do definitely need a thick skin. Um, 100%. One of those, so many things. I mean, we've both got stories that we could tell until, I don't know, until the cows come home about yeah. how we've been treated in football. And imagine some of the things that happened in football to, to you and to me and anyone else that you know. It would never happen in the in the workplace because it just couldn't happen. Yeah. Um, but football is kind of a world on, onto its own, if that makes sense. It's just crazy, crazy. Um, but obviously, I wanted to touch on your baby. We've gone a bit further than that, but... What was it like making your debut? Because obviously you've left Arsenal and then you mentioned obviously you felt really happy signing for Bournemouth and you've got your name on yeah. your back and whatever. And I know what it's like to have your name on your back for the first time. You've never really seen it. Um, yeah. So to that, obviously to get to that stage, you must have been buzzing, like you said. But then to make your debut, how was that? It's amazing. Like my first game for Bournemouth was actually, it was a cup game. I hadn't actually signed. So they they'd said to me, we want to sign you. And my first game for them was a first team game. I can't remember what cup it was, man. It might have been Worthington Cup. I don't know. I don't know what it was. Some cup. Mm. No, it wasn't Worthington because we won it. 
some cup game and we won it and it was my first game and then me and purchase Stephen purchase yeah. we both played in it and that was his first game and my first game he played yeah. right back i played left back yeah. and uh and it was just a surreal thing i was like how was my first game a cup final for a club like this <laughs> and then um yeah and then we came back and that was like the end of the final season i think and then we came back the following season and then played well you know signed and stuff um, but yeah, my first my first league game. I, do you know what? I don't even remember what my first league game was. If I'm honest, um, I remember the first league game of the season. It was Bristol Rovers away, and I thought I was starting, and I didn't even make a bench, mate. I was few, wow. <laughs> and I'm, I'm born in Bristol, right? Yeah. I was like a lot of family in Bristol, and they were all there, and I just presumed I was starting, even though I had a bad preseason and I didn't yeah. play for two weeks, wasn't allowed to. I just, you know, I just, I don't know, I had that confidence that I was like, you know what, no one's doing what I'm doing on the left in Bournemouth, no one. So therefore, this is me. Boy, yeah. the man has different plans, you know, and <laughs> it's mad, it's mad. I, I remember going through so many ups and downs at that club, mm. you know, like, where you're thinking things are going well, and yeah. I, I remember having, in the first team, three games in a row, where I'd played three games in a row, and out of the three games... I'd got man of the match twice, yeah? Mm. And then the fourth game, it was away to Stoke. It was Jermaine Defoe's first game for us. Away to Stoke, it, at Stoke, and it was a cup game. And you, I've just got, uh, three games I've got man of the match in two of them. I just, I didn't even, I had zero concern. Yeah. I wasn't even on the bench in that game. <laughs> I couldn't, but with no explanation, I was just like, so yeah, I, that was just an example of how many ups and downs I had in that club. So that's why I probably don't remember my debut because although I had three years there, I had I signed. What did I sign? I signed a three-year con. No, I signed a two-year contract with a, with an extension, mm-hmm. and then they asked me to to renew it. So I did, and I stayed there for the third year. And um, yeah, it was just such a up. It was a turbulent, turbulent time in my career. Um, when you left Bournemouth. Um, and then yeah. you ended up playing kind of um, lower league football, and I think mm. you playing career up until you mentioned thirty. So looking at probably what five or six years in the lower leagues, and obviously mm. that's a drop down in level. Um, so again, you need to obviously pick yourself up, roll your sleeves up, and obviously get on with it. Um, and like I said, I've been there myself in terms of you kind of looking around thinking like, not where has it gone wrong, but like how can I get out of this situation? And it's tough. People don't realise. Mm. Um, they assume that if you come from, say, Arsenal or Leicester or wherever it may be and you play at those levels, they assume that you're just going to set the ball to light. And it often doesn't work like that. It's very hard. And yeah. when we were playing at that time, you're looking at, what, 2000, 2001, 2002, in the lower leagues at that level, um, around those times, it was more long ball football. Everyone was six foot. Me and you were five foot seven, like slight build and that sort of it wasn't our type of game anyway. And then if you look at non league now, everyone's kind of getting the ball down and passing. So there's more yeah. opportunity for, for younger players to, to go and play at those levels, get noticed. Typical scenario, Jamie Vardy, get noticed and then end up playing kind of higher levels and things. And there's so many players down there of a decent standard because obviously mm-hmm. they filter down from the higher echelons of football and obviously end up bringing their know-how to that level as well. Um, so yeah, you've, you've obviously done that and you're playing there for a period of time and then you managed to get called up to Jamaica so talk to me about that because I want to know who who paid off there's got to be some brown envelopes or black envelopes <laughs> <laughs> bro it doesn't make sense to me <laughs> I don't understand myself so I left Bournemouth yeah. went to ended up going to Woken in the conference yeah. played there for six months mm-hmm. whilst I was at Woken and um, I had Lee Canneville and Joe Kefer were at Torquay in the league. Um, and I'd, I'd, been do, I'd done quite well at Woking. And um, I didn't plan on staying non-league. I thought, I've gone from Bournemouth to Woking. Mm. I couldn't get a club, so I took Woking. They offered me an OK contract. Mm-hmm. I thought, you know what, keep playing, you'll get back up. Yeah. Anyway, so I've done that. And then um, Leroy Senior was a manager at Torquay. And he was like, yeah, we'll have a look at you. But whilst that ha- was happening, I got called up for Jamaica. With Jamaica now, I don't even know how. I remember in training and the manager was like, oh, what was his name? I can't remember his name. And he was like, guy, give a round of applause for Narada, who's been called up for Jamaica. And I'm like, what the, what? Yeah. 
<laughs> was it, as it's a surprise to you, it's a surprise to me. Yeah. Um, Carl Brown was the manager. And I went there, bro. it was the weirdest situation. I went there and Carl Brown, you know, with Jamaicans, they're not, nothing was organised. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know. I, I'm from London and the tournament we played, I played in was in London. So, I, you know, we're in a hotel. They, they was in a hotel in the Excel Centre. I didn't even have a room at the time. I did my training, my first training session with them. And I just, I just thought I was going home. Because like, like Dion Burton and that had their rooms and you know marlon yeah. king had their rooms yeah. and the jamaican players who came over from jamaica i think yeah. um richard langley was there as well yeah. and i just thought whatever man i'm going home and then there's like no yeah we want you to stay here's your room but it was all like everything was just last minute last minute yeah. last minute yeah. um and yeah you know i played in i was on a bench for one game um that was against nigeria and then i came on against republic of ireland yeah. Did all right, you know, came on for about, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes, did okay. And that was just a, that was a weird experience. Like, so I've grown up in a professional scene, yeah? So yeah. football, you know, if your manager says get down at 10 o'clock, you better be there at 5 to 10. Because if you're there at 10 o'clock, you're late, yeah? yeah. Hey, in the Jamaican team, <laughs> I remember them saying lunch is at 10. I was there at 5 to 10. Bro, the manager didn't come down to about half past 10. <laughs> it was honestly... Bonkers! Everyone was just chilled out. One day we were in the we were in the hotel. The yeah. food comes out, and the, all the players are kicking off. Today. They don't like the food. Yeah. Bro, next thing you know, the coach turned up and they took us to a Caribbean restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? Aki and saltfish and everything. Here we go. Bro, they took us to the one on Gate Great Cambridge Roundabout. I can't remember what it's called now. Yeah. But yeah, it was just yeah, it was a crazy experience. But again, loved it. Yeah. Um, my dad. Being the Jamaican person in my family, he was in the crowd. All my family was there. I came on, I represented. Um, proud, proud moment for me because I know obviously at that stage England was I always wanted to play for England. That was never yeah. going to happen. That's um, awesome, mate. I mean, at the end of the day, like I'm only messing when I say like backhanders and all that because um, that's no one can take it away from you. Um, yeah, man. How it occurred and stuff. I'm, I'm like happy for you. When I seen it, I was like, wow, like just amazing. Mm like really happy for you that's that's brilliant and it's a great experience and obviously you can say you played at international level and like i said no one can take that away um but yeah i mean coming to the end obviously i mentioned the podcast and all my listeners well whoever's listened in the past they're aware of the podcast being about athletes having transferable skills and yeah. this is why i like having people like you on because obviously everyone's got a perception of athletes especially footballers and they, they assume that everyone's a multi-millionaire and we're obviously not so it annoys me when the press, they come out and they say things like footballers are X, Y, and Z. It's like footballers, there's different levels in football as there is in every other sport. So we're not all multimillionaires and whatever. So we don't earn loads of money or we haven't all earned loads of money. So yeah. for me now, it's, I'm grateful for having you on, especially as a kind of a friend, ex-teammate. Um, and obviously you played football to a professional level. And now you're yeah. obviously an estate agent, which is in a completely different field. Um, yeah. So commend you for that. Um, again, just let us know like what your transferable skills are, um, because obviously you played football and now you're doing something completely different. So what are you bringing to the table where you work now? Do you know what? I think my transferable skills are definitely my personality, 100%. Um, football, uh, it allowed me to mix with all walks of life. Uh, you know yourself when you're a footballer um you know the world's going crazy right now of racism but mm. you'll know that when you work when you play within a football club or work within a football club you could be with an italian person irish person black person african person mm. whatever and we we all get along why because we need each other it's a team sport mm. um so football taught me that it that, that was the first thing you know i understand I, I got to understand different cultures very quickly yeah. um and I think also football gave me resilience. So we spoke earlier about, you know, the, the, the kind of what wouldn't happen in a, in a workplace can happen in football. And in football, I have been, whether it be through injury, where you keep getting injured, but you have to keep going, whether it be the manager doesn't rate you, but you have to prove yourself, whether it be you've got a really fast winger against you and he's got the break of you once, but you don't want to get the, in the break of you the second time. 
it doesn't matter whatever it is you have to be resilient and you you always have to have the, you know that focus and um, and even when you're down you know you have to be able to bounce back um and that's the other good thing about football is you're only as good as your last game you might have a crap game on saturday you play on tuesday and you get mom and all of a sudden saturday's gone yeah. so transferring that into what i do now I could have a fantastic week at work and do how many other deals, um, but I have to always stay humble and be like, well, that was this week. You've got to reset the clock. You've got to go again. You've got another game come Monday because you banked four deals this week. That's only as good as last week because when Monday comes and the following Friday comes, your area director says, well, what have we done this week? They don't care about what we did last week. And, you know, you've got to, for me, I took that from football as well. It helped you being able to be resilient and... Um, and yeah, I think I'd probably say those are the biggest things, the personality, the resilience, um, and, and being able to work with people mm. that I think football teaches you that. Um, and I think if you're a footballer, you know, and it's, and it's going well for you, great, run away with it, whatever. Mm. But if you're, if you're a footballer and it's not going well for you, you need to understand that it doesn't end there. Mm. Uh, it only ends there if you want it to end there. It might end if you might take two years out because you don't know what you're doing. You can't find your feet. You know, like I took some time out. You know, I didn't know what I was doing, and I ended up, you know, landing on my feet. But it's you know, it's not the end of the world. And I think when you're growing up like you and I was, with the thought of becoming a footballer, uh, and to be honest with us, you, you, you and I and other people, we've we had the right to feel that way because we had our contracts. We had. Yeah. We had names who was, you know, household names. Talk, you know, I had Arsene Wenger looking at me like, yeah, that's a great respect ever. I played yeah. alongside Tony Adams, mm. you know, and he's telling me I did well that day. And so, you know, you've got the right to have that confidence. Mm. But you also need to understand that if it doesn't happen for you, the world doesn't end. Mm. You know what I mean? You can go out there and get yourself a job or get your own business, whatever you choose to do. It's massive, bro. Uh, I love everything you said there, and I 100% agree with everything you said. And mm -hmm. I always say, look, when I was playing, people used to discuss, whether it be friends outside of the game or within the game, discussing retirement. Um, and it was always seen as a negative, and I've said this many times on previous podcasts. And I want to let everyone know that retirement and the process shouldn't be seen as a negative. You need to embrace it, because let's say, what, the average retirement age, I don't know, off the top of my head, you're looking at 35, 36 maybe slightly longer nowadays, because obviously infrastructure and facilities and players are fitter and whatever else. But once you've retired at 35, 36, you've got your whole life still ahead of you. Fact. So in the outside world, 35, 36, you're just a young man or a young woman. So why would you then think, oh, well, I've finished football. Fair enough, you, you may not know what you're doing or you may not know what you want to go into and you may have to take a few knocks on the way. But just mm. pick yourself up and I'm not saying just get on with it and dismiss it, but sometimes you need to fall to understand where you're going you can dismiss that you can say well i know that's not for me now because it didn't work out so i can just put that in the bin and move on to something else yeah. so like i said um the opportunities there footballers sometimes well athletes sometimes don't don't realize how fortunate they are in terms of their network and kind of people that they can draw on to maybe get help um mm -hmm. so again that's another piece of advice that i always give out but um do you think this is a question i like to ask as well do you think more help needed for athletes we, we talk about football because obviously we've played the game but i'm talking on a bro broader scale now uh, mm. or you can or you can just focus on football if you want do you think more help's needed when it comes to retirement because i don't know if you got any help at all i mean if you did brilliant um a lot of people i speak to they say they did or they didn't uh, mm. but yeah i mean what, what do you think on that I think 100%. I'm quite blessed to have a great um, background. My parents, they're there for me. And my dad, you met my dad many a times. And you know, he's like, he's, you know, forget football. He was always there for me from the morning, from the get go. And he made sure that, you know, he's the reason why I invested in property and ever, you know, I just wanted a car and a nice watch. That's all I ever wanted. Yeah. But he's the reason I, you know, I did what I did. And so if it wasn't for my dad, I know that my life could have turned out differently, um, but I do think, in answer to your question, that more is needed. I think a lot of footballers, I think, so there's two sides to it. Footballers who come to the end of their their career, um, maybe they haven't made the money that the likes of Ashley Cole has, so they still need to work. They need help. 
they need help they need sense of direction they need sense of how to you know value money because when you're a young footballer and you've only got yourself to think about i don't care what you're earning every footballer looks like they're earning the same money as ashley cole that's just the way it is they spend their money on flash stuff whatever but they need to understand how to value their money otherwise they learn the hard way and the hard way is loads of debt you know i had debt when i finished the game you know lucky enough to be in zero debt now but that's through understanding life um there's that side and then there's also the side of um people who want to get into the game um and need to understand the potentials and have a backup in place so for me way more needs to be done um there's also a side as well which i'll touch on even though i haven't experienced this so those players who do make lots of money and they do finish their career and they don't actually need to work but they also need help with coming away from the game yeah because what they could end up doing is wasting their money on stuff whatever they're going to do they need help with what to do with investment they need help with mental side you know because you're used to a thousand people knowing who you are you get a little bit older no one cares who you are so there's so many aspects to that um question i think that we could do better in well i say we but the fa pfa whoever yeah. uh, but they're all relevant and i think yeah. you'll see if we do that because there's some talented kids in football yeah. not just football players but you know mentally and yeah. you know, they can offer so much you know they've probably got a big financial um background where they can help because they've made money in football and they ain't got a clue yeah yeah that's true massive um and you made some good points there um and i've, I've kind of been thinking I spoke to various different people in previous podcasts and I, I still think now that i mean when we used to go say let's call it the yts scheme because obviously that's what we called it at that, at that stage when we were kind of yeah. 16 17 and you'd mm. go to college. I never had to just because I was playing at a certain level. So the, the manager and the coaches always said, look, just come in and train. Um, mm. So yeah, people used to go and they'd just mess about. It was just like a day off. It was just a free reign. So they're not really going there to learn anything. So it was like a, a pointless exercise and probably financially um, detrimental as well um, to whoever's funding it. I think it was funded by, I don't know, if the PFA or not. I'm not too sure. Um, so I think... In this day and age, I think players should be going out on, on workplace placements. So in that, what I mean is, you're 16, 17, or there or thereabouts, go and work in an office on your day yeah. off or half a day instead of going to college. Unless you're going to college and you've got a specific course that you're on or whatever, that's fine. If you yeah. haven't, and even if you don't know what direction you want to go in, because 16, 17, you're probably not thinking about retirement. You probably don't know that you, you're going to end up working in property or something else. But just step away from the game slightly and work in a different environment so that people get to see what you're like as a, as a footballer, because people, like I said, have got perceptions, and also get to see what they're like, your customer service skills, dealing with difficult clients, dealing with different aspects of working in an office or a warehouse or going out and coaching kids in the community or something, mm -hmm. just to see a different perspective because it's fine training Monday, Tuesday, day off Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, game on Saturday. That's fine. And then I, I want all these players That's to the make it. Yeah, <laughs> I want, I, yeah, I want all these players to make it at, at the highest level for as long as possible. That, that, I'm not taking that away from them, but what I'm trying to say is there's a different side to life as well. I don't want people just to be stuck in that football bubble. For me, I was never in that football bubble. So, yeah, I used to go out and socialise. I'd train hard. I'd do my extra training on my own if needs be. No one could tell me anything. No one could say, oh, no, it's like, oh, you're being busy. Like, you're just trying to do that so the manager sees you. That didn't affect me because I just thought, I don't care. I just need to do what I need to do. Good, yeah. bad, and different. But not yeah. everyone's like that. Um, I'd take a book into um, on the coach on the way to a game. I'd read a book or whatever. And that book would just be, it wouldn't be like a fantasy book. It would be about like someone's autobiography or someone talking about life skills or experiences mm -hmm. that will affect you going forward in life. That was just me. And no one really said anything, maybe because I was always kind of in and around the, the crowd and whatever. And I was always seen as just, I don't know, just a, a cool dude in inverted commas, whatever it may be. I, I, I didn't care about any of that. But I've mm. seen players who have got interests and sometimes people will say certain things and then they kind of get put off by that and 
just it's just annoying. But I do I do think that more can be done. I do think that players should be doing something in their off time. Um, and it wouldn't. They've got a lot of time on their hands, and yeah. we take it for granted. I did too. I finished training at what two o'clock, one o'clock. What I do go home, um, watch house party. Do you know what I mean, or watch whatever kid and play. But what what do you know what? It's like something as simple as. I wish, you know, lucky I had my dad talking to me at my, uh, in my days, but something as simple as someone saying to you, your football career, if you're lucky, if you're lucky, you'll be a professional footballer until you're 30, 35. That's a very lucky, you know, if you started at 16, mm. you're lucky if you get that career, right? Mm. So if you're lucky, you get that. Now, remember, this money that you're earning, whether it's brilliant, okay, or scraping to get by, it's only going to be until this age potentially yeah. it could be 28 25 22 whatever so the money you're earning if this is what you're doing right now and you'll think you're hoping it can be a lifetime but yet every week you're spending a thousand pounds on bottles of champagne mm -hmm. trainers blah 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 so simple questions to these young kids to say to yourself have you thought about what's going to happen at the... of course their mindset is well i'll get it forever but we all know if you're saving, if you're saving any amount of money each month, it isn't because you think you're going to be rich for life. It's because of what if. So these kids need to be taught, what if? Are you thinking about that? Mm. You know what I mean? And if you're earning substantial enough, um, enough money, have you invested? Mm. And I don't mean invested in that flat in Bolton that costs you 100 grand because that's not going to make any money. Have you invested in Hampstead? Have you invested in London? Have you invested in Primrose Hill? Because that's where the the wealthy people are investing, mm -hmm. and some of these footballers who, you know, they've got a five year contract, four year contract, so they would qualify to be able to buy a decent property. Mm -hmm. Go and invest in it, even if it's a council flat. Yeah. Go and invest in it, because by the time you're finish your career, you probably got a nice change there waiting for you. But a lot of these, like, these are the questions I think I would like to talk to people about, or see, you know, more conversations about to the young kids. Massive. Listen, um, great to catch up. Um, long time no see. Um, great that you're obviously doing well. I uh, appreciate your time today. Just let everyone know where we can find you personally on the socials. Mm. Um, and obviously let everyone know where we can find you in terms of the company you're working for at the moment. I know you're yeah. doing a bit of PT and on the side as well. So just let everyone know where we can find you. Estate agents, PT and obviously you personally on the well, socials. I'll plug my PT first. So I do an online session right now. This is all was born in lockdown. I used to be a PT, stopped doing it. Um, and now um, I started training and, and then I've created my own business and it's called Neighborhood Fitness. Uh, the background is I started in my back garden and I did a few sessions. My neighbor wanted to do it. Then her daughter wanted to do it, who was in Barcelona. Then my neighbor's neighbor wanted to do it. Anyway, that's how Neighborhood Fitness came about. And it, it grew. It did really well, you know. Not not crazy, but it did well. And it was all a free service for the whole of lockdown. And then I went back to work and people wanted me to continue it. So um, now we do donate. I do donations. It's not actually, you know, a subscription or a certain amount. It's donations. Um, and we run it on Monday at 7 p.m., Wednesday 7 a.m., Friday 7 a.m., Saturday 10 a.m. Um, hit training. Don't need no weights, no nothing. So that's the first thing. Uh, Neighborhood Fitness um, on Instagram. Look it up. You'll see me. Um, my day-to-day -day work in the estate agent, I'm not going to mention the company because I just don't, don't want to. Uh, my own, so therefore I'm not going to mention it. <laughs> I work for a company in North London, and um, but if you need some help with finding a place to rent, definitely hit me up. I'm on Instagram, Narada. You'll find me N A R A D A. Um, yeah, and that's that's me, man. Love that, Narada B. We'll catch up soon, hopefully. I know everyone says it. Um, but hopefully, we'll catch up. Um, like I said, uh, appreciate you coming on today. Um, Glad that you're doing well. Keep doing what you're doing and uh, we'll go from there. Thanks, man. Next time, don't take so long to get in touch with me, all right? <laughs> <laughs> take care. Yeah. Stop, man, Dan. Thanks. Yeah.